Hey, welcome back everybody. I just got this question into my Ask Mark inbox and uh, you know I kind of read it and empathized with the individual here and it said, Hey Mr. Blue Globe, I'm really into electronics and want to be able to repair some of my own equipment if it ever dies and possibly build some projects. However, I really struggle to grasp some of the concepts and it feels like you need a rocket scientist degree to understand this stuff. Am I missing something or is it really this hard? Seth from Down Under, and I'm assuming Down Under uh, might mean um, Australia there. So Seth, thanks for this question. I think it's a really good one, and uh, I'm going to take a little bit of time here today to tell you why I think electronics are uh, tough to grasp, and maybe a few tips on how you could overcome that. All right, Seth and uh, everyone else watching out here, visualization, that is the number one reason I think electronics are hard. And I said here, you can't watch the electrons kind of running around inside of your circuit. Um, some people are visually oriented, this makes it tough. If you happen to work with me in corporate America, um, if you saw me come into a meeting, I would, I would quickly orient myself to the side of the table that was closest to a whiteboard on the wall. Um, that way, during the meeting, if I had a, a point I was trying to convey to everybody, you may just see me spin over to the whiteboard, draw a picture, and kind of walk you through what I'm thinking. It's how I communicate, it's how I think, is visually. And I think a lot of people are like that. And if, if you are, it kind of makes this electronic stuff a little tougher because you can sit there and look at a circuit board all day long and you can't see anything. You can't watch the voltage, the power, the current, um, any of those things. And so, you know, um, when I was going through electrical engineering degree program, um, you know, there were a couple different uh, tracks in the uh, coll engineering college I was in. There was mechanical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering at that time. And, I, you know, we all took the same math, physics, uh, you know, underlying kind of classes. But then we had our specialty um, classes related to our engineering. So I knew a lot of these uh, other engineering majors. And um, I always thought they had it easier than I did. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, that's probably just my point of view, but, you know, um, civil, you can you can kind of watch the lay of the land or, um, you know, the, the, the slope of this um, thing or whatnot. The same with a uh, mechanical engineer. You could actually see the cogs turning, um, you know, the pivots, whatever. Um, these were things you could visualize and see. And there were several points in times I thought about swapping degree programs because of that. And I'm kind of glad I stuck with the electronics, even though I can't see as much of it. I think this is the number one reason people struggle with it. So the number one way I know to overcome this visualization issue is to, one, get you a digital multimeter um, and a simple oscilloscope and learn to use those things. Watch YouTube videos on how to use them. Um, learn how to read schematics. Um, and get you a simple radio. I might would recommend something like a, um, you know, a 1960s or 70s transistor radio. Something pretty simple. Uh, don't go pulling out a uh, Pioneer SX1250 or something. Those get pretty complicated. I'm just talking about a, like a little uh, clock radio or something. Um, find something that has, if you can, a Sam's Photofax. So you, know, you may wonder, well, what the heck's a Sam's Photofax? Years ago, um, there's a company, Sam's, and they made these little binders, basically, that would um, take what the original manufacturer had done and take it to a whole new level. So I'll show you a picture here. This is a good example of a Sam's PhotoFact picture. They've taken the schematic, and now they've also added the, all the voltages throughout this whole thing that should be there. So now you can take your digital multimeter and start walking through this circuit and kind of understand what voltages should be where. And a lot of these SAMS photo facts will even show little pictures of oscilloscope screens. I actually used to do a lot of repair of... Um, both CB and ham radio equipment. And a lot of the um, SAMS photo facts that existed back then, this would have been in the late 80s, early 90s, they, um, they had really good pictures of oscilloscopes, showed you what the modulation should look like at this point in time. And it would show you right where to put your oscilloscope probes and you could, you could kind of see this stuff. And it'll walk, kind of walk you through learning visually. I'll tell you, the SAMS photo facts helped me more than anything when I was getting into electronics. Unfortunately, they don't make SAMS photo facts anymore. 
and they were heavily oriented towards you know just general consumer electronics televisions things of that nature of the past so there's a lot of devices you could learn this visualization through i might would recommend staying away from tube gear as you're learning you know there's a lot of high voltages floating around in tube gear you'd be much safer uh, kind of probing around in a uh, a solid state receiver or something all right number two reason it's all relative so when you're talking about voltages in a circuit, it's kind of all relative. Um, it's about the difference in potential between two points, okay? So if you're measuring a component on one end and then measuring the other end, and you see a voltage difference between those two points, um, then you could say that's what the voltage is across this device. Well, sometimes and many times, one side of that, um, your measurement will be at ground, so at zero volts. So this, then if you measure the other side of it and it says five volts, well, then you say, okay, this point right here is five volts of potential. Um, but many other times, you may be measuring at points where both sides, neither side of whatever you're measuring, is at ground. So you may be measuring where one side of a component is at 100 volts and you measure the other side of the, the component and it shows 105 volts. It's still the same 5 volt potential across those two. They just don't happen to be sitting at a reference of ground. They happen to be sitting at a reference of 100 volts. And I think this confuses a lot of people as you start talking about positive and negative voltages. So if you measured something that was positive 10 volts and maybe it also there was another part of the component you know or circuit that was at negative 10 volts relative to ground um, if you would happen to then measure from that negative 10 volts to the positive 10 volts um, without referencing it back to ground you would find that there's 20 volts across those two it's about the potential between points and so it's kind of all relative back to your starting point or what you're measuring against um, as to how you come up with these voltages. And I think, I think everybody sometimes maybe, or a lot of people maybe always assume that it's always referenced back to zero volts. Um, and it's, it's not always the case as you're working with electronics. A lot of times in tube gear, you may be measuring against the cathode. So the voltage of the grid versus the cathode is your bias point, not the voltage of your grid um, to ground. Um, and so it's just something you gotta kinda get your head around. What are you actually referencing against? There again, the best way I know to solve this or to kinda get your head around it, find a device um, that you can sit there with a multimeter and measure voltages. Find something that has a schematic that has all the voltages laid out on it. And you can find a Sam's Photofact that has that. A lot of times you can find other schematics that have all the voltages laid out on it. And just measure and start to understand. Maybe measure that component against ground. Maybe measure it against the other side of that component. And you may go, hmm, that's two different voltages. Um, I think it will help you in starting to understand how electronics work. Uh, it's all about this difference in potential and your reference points and, uh, and start to learn in circuits what they're referencing again. Number three reason I think people really struggle with uh, some electronics concepts and that is that at any given point in a circuit you may have a combination of DC and AC all at that same point, all on that same wire and they may be performing different functions within that circuit at the same point in time. And I kind of give an example of this. I did it in one of my other videos. Um, if you had a small little trampoline and you were jumping up and down on it, unless maybe you were going down a foot and up two foot when you were jumping, right? So you could kind of look at that as an alternating current of three feet, <laughs> or in this case, we'll call it three volts. Um, and then what if you took that trampoline and you went up to the top of a skyscraper and you're now 200 feet in the air. Well, uh, think of that as you're now 200 volts in the air, okay? Your potential versus ground, if that's what you're measuring against, um, is now 200 volts at your starting point. And now let's say you jump, start jumping up and down this thing, three volts, okay? Well, now you're going from 200 volts, you know, up and down, you know, three volts around that. 
Um, and so you kind of got to get your head around. You can be at a different DC offset potential and still have AC varying on top of that. And they may be for different purposes in the circuit. Um, a good example of that would be, and I'll show you a circuit right here. Okay, a good example here. This is a circuit that we're using, the power supply for the single-ended KT88 circuit that we're currently um, building a video series on. But if you'll notice right here, you've got this point in the transformer where you have a 5-volt AC winding. And it's putting off 5 volts AC that feeds over here to number pin, pin number 2. And it also feeds over here to pin number 8 of the uh, cathode here in this 5AR4. Well, this cathode also is playing the role of the heater. So that 5 volts is designed to heat up the filament here in this um, tube and make the tube function properly. So that 5 volts AC is needed to make the tube function. But then once the tube is functioning, this, these two points are also serving as the cathode that are picking up the rectified voltage coming off of this side of the tube. And so right here at this point that goes up and, and ties off on this uh, high tension line, you may have as much as 500 volts DC sitting right here or more. So you could look, if you put a scope on this point right here or a digital multimeter and you flipped your digital multimeter over to AC, you would measure about 5 volts AC right there. If you flipped it over to DC, you would maybe see 500 volts or more right there of DC. And so at any given point in a circuit, you can have both and they may be there for different purposes. As in this case, the AC is to heat the filaments. The DC then is to feed the rest of this power supply uh, the high voltage it needs to then feed the plates of the tubes. All right, number four reason. I think sometimes people make this seem harder than it really is, and it scares people off. Um, let me give you a good analogy here, okay? There are probably a very small percentage of people in the world that could actually start from scratch and design a car engine. Um, you know, there's a lot of physics and a lot of math that would go into um, properly designing one, right? However, look at the flip side of it. Almost on every corner in every city, everywhere you go, there's an automotive repair shop, okay? So a much larger percentage of people, um, maybe they don't, you go talk to your average auto mechanic, they don't know how to design a car engine. They couldn't design a transmission from scratch. However, they have learned the practical aspects of how engines work and how transmissions work, and they could repair your transmission or your, um, your engine. The same concept applies with electronics, okay? If you want to be a, a design engineer and actually design circuits from scratch, you probably need a four-year electronics engineering degree, maybe even a master's to be um, really, really good at it. But if you want to just learn how to repair some things, maybe understand how circuits work, maybe build some small projects based off of some schematics that someone else has already designed, you can learn this stuff and you can do it. Don't be scared away by the heavy, heavy math and physics. Reserve that for the guys that are doing the design work. If you want to be a uh, repair or understand or maybe uh, build some simple projects, I think you can do that on your own uh, without a formal uh, education in this. So don't be scared of it. Watch some YouTube videos, uh, get you some simple books. Uh, there's a lot of good info out there that'll help you get there. And don't be scared away by the, uh, the deepness that this can become when you really get into the design and engineering side of things. All right, the fifth and uh, last reason I think that uh, People struggle a little bit with electronics as they quickly get overwhelmed when they look at a schematic of something. And I will tell you, if you take a schematic and you break it down, you know, as I put here, the proverbial, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. How do you analyze a circuit? One little section at a time, okay? Let me walk you through this circuit really, really quick. Okay, super um, common amplifier out there. It's the Fender Deluxe 5C3. Um, you kind of break this thing down into sections here, like this little section right down in here. This is your power supply. Power feeding in, going to rectifier, coming through some filter capacitors. This part down here creates the power, uh, the voltages needed um, to feed the rest of this amplifier. You then start over here. you got a couple input jacks. You feed into a tube here that happens to be a driver tube. Okay, so you can kind of isolate this whole section off right here 
as a uh, the driver section of this. Then it kind of gets fed into this circuit here that ultimately um, takes your signal and splits it apart um, into positive um, waveform and negative waveform um, so that you can feed a push-pull amplifier section here. So this whole section will be called your phase inverter section. Then you'll come along to this section here. This will be your output tube section here. And then ultimately you're going through a power transformer feeding out into your speaker. So if you kind of break it down into just section after section after section and analyze it, it becomes much easier to grasp and put your head around and understand how each little section is working versus kind of being frightened by this overall schematic here looking at it at one time. All right, I'm going to leave you with why are electronics so hard to grasp? They really aren't. Stick with it. Be inquisitive. Ask questions. Get a circuit, a schematic, something that has voltages on it. Get in there and probe around. Learn. Build little projects. Time and effort will win in this scenario. You keep doing it. You'll learn it. You'll start to figure things out. I learn things new every single day. I'm like, wow, I didn't really quite realize that hmm, that makes sense to me now. It, it, um, and, and I've been doing this for 35 years now. So um, keep at it. Don't give up. Um, you can learn electronics. Thanks for watching, everybody.